Hello everyone and welcome to Big Rock Moto. Thanks so much for tuning in. In the final episode of the Honda Transalp 750 long-term test, yes, it is sad that the series is coming to an end after nine episodes, but in today's episode, we're gonna cover a lot of the stuff that you all have been requesting uh, that I cover. So we're gonna talk about the, we're gonna summarize the pros and cons to the bike, the way I see the pros and cons anyway. I'm gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into some of the comparisons you know, between this and the other middleweight adventure motorcycles, but especially uh, its direct competitors, the V-Storm 800DE, the Touareg 660, uh, the Tenere 700. We're gonna briefly discuss whether I'm keeping uh, the Transalp in the garage for my personal use, uh, and then we'll also have a chance in this video for you to ask questions below. All right, so I really wanna thank all of the companies, vendors, sponsors who sent parts and supported uh, the build and the review series of this Transalp. Uh, I can't name them all because I would definitely forget some people, but I'm just really grateful to all those companies who have you know, sent products for testing, for demonstration, whether it was free, whether it was a discount, it's all very much appreciated and it helped make this possible. So thank you very much. And also to thank you, the viewers, for watching this series. It's been a pleasure to film this, a real privilege, and I've been happy to be able to do it. I do wanna start by just addressing something that I get asked quite a bit, or I get kind of interesting questions about this. So a lot of people might kind of stumble onto this channel and say, oh, this guy bought a Honda Transalp for himself. He must, you know, this must be the best bike, or this is the bike he chose. Well, not necessarily, and we'll talk about that in this review series. I primarily bought the Transalp because I knew that there was a tremendous amount of interest worldwide about the Honda, and I wanted to thoroughly test it over a six to nine month period, um, see what the capabilities are, see what the possibilities are in terms of modification. And that's really why I did this. So this was really a content-based purchase. Not to say I don't like the Transalp, I do like it and I think it's a fantastic motorcycle. But is it my personal favorite adventure bike? No, and uh, I guess that kind of answers that question up front. Is this the bike I'm gonna be keeping around for myself? No, and the reason for that is simply that I feel that um, given, if, if you don't look at the financial part of it, right, the cost part of it, um, if you're willing to upgrade and spend more money, there are other adventure bikes that do more. Uh, you just have to pay more to get that. So anyway, and plus I have to move on and test different bikes here on the channel. So for me to keep the trends up any longer than I already have, uh, that doesn't make any business sense or any financial sense, even if I were to really love the bike. So, all right, let's summarize the pros and cons as I see it to the Honda Transalp. So for me, the number one pro is the price point and the value. For under $10,000 US, you get an extremely comfortable, capable, reliable, uh, practical adventure motorcycle. That is quite a bargain in today's money. If we consider that the R1300 GS I'm going to pick up actually tomorrow uh, is $30,000 out the door, and it's about $28,000 plus tax and fees and things like that. Considering that this Honda, you could buy almost three Transalps for one fully loaded R1300 GS. Wow, that is really saying something. So I think the value is really, really good. Uh, the reliability, I have not had a single issue hiccup or anything with the Transalp in the, I've had it for about seven months. Now I know this is not really a long-term review because I'm not able to do that. As a content creator, I can't keep a bike five or 10 years. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense for this business. However, long-term according you know, to this channel anyway, or compared to a, a two-day ride by some other journalists who go to press launches, this was long-term. The point is, I haven't had any reliability concerns or issues. It's never had to go back to the dealer. The maintenance has been easy. And I would predict, based on other Honda models and you know the, the data that we see out there, that this bike should be one of the most reliable motorcycles you could get, period. So that's a good thing for people who are traveling and people who don't want any drama and put a lot of miles on their bike. The next pro for me is the comfort of the bike. This is one of the most comfortable adventure motorcycles, not, e not even just comfortable mid-weight adventure bikes. This is one of the most comfortable adventure motorcycles across the board. 
The seat is incredibly nice. The wind protection is very, very good. There's no vibration from the engine. There's no heat from the engine that I can sense, which is really rare these days. The overall comfort, the ergonomics, the riding position, riding triangle, the bike is phenomenally comfortable. So for, for people who travel and tour, uh, although we don't have cruise control, we don't have tubeless wheels, so that kind of you know, balances that out. But for people who tour, this is a very, very comfortable bike. Next up for me is the engine. You know, I, I kind of expected the Trans Alp to be a little bit boring maybe, and maybe that wasn't fair, uh, but it turns out that the engine has quite some spunk to it, has some character, it has a great sound, it, it's pretty quick, it's pretty powerful. Um, so I really, really enjoy the engine, plus the fact you just never feel any vibration coming through the bike. One of the biggest things that surprised me in my time with the Transalp is how much fun it is to ride and how much personality it has. <laughs> I mean, it has that fun factor, that giggle factor that I didn't expect at the start of this test when I purchased this bike. Um, that's been a very pleasant surprise. Another pro for me, and this kind of seems like a weird thing to say, but uh, the exhaust hanger on the bike, uh, so when you drop some of these adventure bikes, it can contact the exhaust. Well, the exhaust hanger on the Transalp is, is, is a bolt-on part that goes into the frame. So if you were to bend that or something like that in a fall because it impacts the exhaust, you'd be able to replace that and you wouldn't actually damage the entire frame or subframe of the bike. That's nice. Now, the, sub, the frame of the bike is not a detachable subframe, so that's a downside. Uh, but compared to one of its closest rivals, the Tenere 700, which has that welded on exhaust hanger, I do appreciate the bolt on uh, of, the, of the Transalp. Uh, the next up on the Pro is the seat height. The seat height is very reasonable for an adventure bike, so that's nice. Uh, we already mentioned the lack of engine heat. So those are the pros, there's others, but those are the main ones I wanted to, main ones I wanted to cover. Uh, what are the downsides? So the low hanging engine and exhaust, yes, uh, it, it does have less ground clearance. And especially once you put a skid plate on it, which is mandatory if you're gonna go off pavement, um, it doesn't have the ground clearance of a lot of its competitors. That can be an issue uh, when you're crossing obstacles uh, and you're riding more harder enduro stuff, which you may or may not do with the Trans Alp, but it's something I, I need you to understand. It is kind of low and vulnerable. Uh, no cruise control, no tubeless wheels. For such a comfortable bike that's amazing for touring, it is quite uh, frustrating, I suppose, to put it nicely, that Honda chose not to put cruise control on a bike that's already ride-by-wire. So it doesn't use throttle cables, it uses ride-by-wire. So why doesn't it have cruise? Well, I also think that our expectations as consumers are changing, are increasing, we're more demanding these days. 10 years ago, nobody would have expected to get cruise control. Now we're all expecting it. So. That balance is in there too. And the V-Strom doesn't have it, and the Tenere 700 doesn't have it. And I also feel that Honda wants you to get the Africa Twin. They want you to have an upgrade path. They're a company, I don't blame them. They wanna make money, they wanna sell their more expensive models. So cruise control, tubeless wheels, all the other features, get the Africa Twin. I think that, that might be their thinking, at least that's what I would assume. All right, uh, the suspension on the Transalp. The good thing about the suspension is it's comfortable and soft. The bad thing is it's comfortable and soft. So if you're an aggressive off-road rider wanting to ride a bit faster, or if you're heavier, uh, perhaps carrying uh, you know, passengers and cargo, things like that, the, the bike is uh, fairly softly sprung. So the trade-off is that smooth, plush ride, but it doesn't like to be hurried off-road because you will uh, bottom out the suspension uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's also not adjustable. So a lot of the competitors, in fact, most of its competitors, I think, have adjustable suspension. And the Transalp, you get preload adjusters, but that's it. Uh, another downside on the Transalp is the electronic system is kind of, uh, it's overly intrusive and it's annoying how it continually resets. So uh, now a lot of people will say, oh, well, there's a law that, you know, it has to reset ABS and traction control. That's not true at all. Um, if that was the case, then BMW and Ducati and KTM uh, on those bikes, uh, if you turn off the traction control or turn it way down or turn off the ABS to the back wheel anyway, uh, it will remember those settings when you cycle the key on Ducati, BMW, KTM, and maybe some others. I think Aprilia maybe too. Uh, it may not remember if you turn off the whole ABS system to the front wheel, but it does remember the back and it does remember the traction control. So. I don't know why, so first of all, that's not a law, that's just a myth, I don't know how that got started. Um, 
And it's frustrating that every time you start the Honda, if you're riding in the dirt, you have to go back through, you know, get the traction control off because the traction control on the Honda is not usable in the dirt, really. If, even if turned all the way down, it's still incredibly intrusive. So it's really not very usable. And the ABS is very intrusive as well, even the front. So I would just like to see the, the bike remember those settings a little bit better because there's no shortcut to do it. You can't program the rider mode to turn off traction control and ABS, even though it has that programmable rider mode, if you, it won't let you program it to that. So you have to go through all the little pie charts and turn the things off and confirm and way too many button pushes. Anyway, enough said. Uh, the other downside is uh, the maintenance issue of the air filter being under the fuel tank. This is a deal breaker for me as a bike for myself because I ride in groups, it's dusty. I live in the desert southwest of the USA. We have dust. We have people riding together and it's dust, just dust. And uh, we need to clean our air filters frequently. I'm not gonna remove the gas tank of my motorcycle uh, every month you know, to clean my air filter, forget it. So. The same reason I'm not gonna buy a Desert X for my own personal use, although I'd love to have one for testing for long term. It's the same reason I wouldn't get the Trans Alp. For me, that's a deal breaker feature on a bike that's meant for off-road travel. Sorry, I'm just telling you, I'm telling it like it is. All right, this is now the comparison section. So a lot of people have sent me, I get, frankly, I probably get questions every day about, should I get the Trans Alp or a Tenere 700? Is the Touareg okay? Is it, or is it gonna break down? You know, Should I upgrade to get a KTM 890? Should I get a Tiger? I mean, so there's a lot to unpack here. So what I wanna do is give you a couple different versions, a couple different ways to kind of look at this comparison. I can't ultimately tell you which bike in the category you should buy. You have to decide that. Um, however, I can kind of tell you the pros and cons of each, how they kind of stack up and give you my thoughts about which bikes are best for which kind of you know use cases or how you ride or where you ride, where you live, things like that. So there's a couple ways we can do this. So I'm gonna put up on the screen here uh, I have a, a comparison matrix that I'm developing for all the adventure motorcycles I've ever tested. Um, and I'm pu also putting the ones on there that I have yet to test and leaving those scores blank. Uh, and I'll put this up on the screen, but uh, first of all, I've developed some scoring categories. So in addition to having all this, the important relevant specs uh, on this sheet, you're also going to see uh, the uh, scoring that I have. Now, I will have this available for download very soon once I kind of get um, it all dialed in. It's a, it's a lot of numbers. I have to populate a lot of research I have to do uh, and the scoring as well I have to complete. Uh, I'm just showing you the filtered results now for kind of the midweight bikes because I haven't completed all the other adventure bikes yet. But it's gonna be a good way to compare relative performance between different bikes, right? And we can look at the price and specs, of course, things like that too. Uh, I think it'd be really cool. Uh, now. And I'll make that available for download once it's ready. But for now, I'll just show it up here on the screen. So I break all the adventure bikes into weight classes, right? So a lightweight adventure bike, as I define it, would be below 450 pounds or 204 kilograms. The middleweight bikes are between 450 to 510 pounds or 204 to 231 kilo kilos. And heavy would be 510 pounds or 231 kilos or heavier, right? Uh, then the score, so let's talk about my scores, and I'll put this up here too. The off-road score for these bikes, um, here's how I define it. Performance and capability in gravel, rocks, ruts, sand, bumps, mud, the ease of riding off-road, the stress level of riding, uh, the ability to carry speed, your confidence level, the usefulness of the electronics, and the suspension performance. So if you consider all those factors, then I give it a score one to 10, right? And it's a relative score. Uh, right, so and then on-road score, performance and capability on highways, twisty roads, urban roads, engine performance and power, suspension performance and braking performance. So everything that you would think about and sort of testing a road bike or a street going bike, you know, how do all those factors add up? And then I give it a score uh, from one to 10. Uh, comfort score, so this is gonna be seating comfort, ergonomic comfort, rider triangle, wind management, heat management, uh, vibration level, touring suitability, suspension comfort all that kind of stuff. So that I'm gonna factor all those things together and give that a score out of one to 10 for all the adventure bikes. And then the fun score. This one is uh, the, the hardest one for me to do because it, it can be quite subjective. But I will tell you that, you know, it's like if you, in some of my reviews, you'll hear me kind of laughing and giggling like a schoolgirl, you know, in some of the, when I'm riding the bikes, that would be a high fun factor, right? Um, and then some bikes are like, it's a little bit harder to get excited because they don't give you quite the adrenaline rush or the, or the fun factor. Um, so it is a relative ranking that I can absolutely give you. It's just, it gets a little bit more arguable, I suppose. Uh, and it's relative, depends on what your riding experience is. 
This is the ability to provide thrills, the adrenaline rush, uh, giggles, and writing satisfaction, and the emotion that it makes you feel. That's pretty subjective, but I think that a lot of us ride motorcycles for the thrill, for the fun, for the adrenaline, for the, for the feeling of it, not just for the practicality of it. And I think it's important to try to give some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of rating to that. So I'll put this sheet up on the screen here. This is my comparison sheet for all of the uh, middleweight adventure bikes. I'm also gonna leave in the CB500X or the or what they call the NX500 now. It's the same, kind of the same bike really. Uh, I'm leaving that in just because I think that's getting cross-shopped quite a bit with the Transalp. Uh, so here's all the midweight bikes and you can see, you know, I've got like the beginner rating, which is green, yellow, red. I'll talk about that in a later video. Uh, the prices, the weights, the seat heights, the power, the fuel capacity, suspension travel, maintenance, major service interval, and then my scoring system. So you can kind of take this as you want. You can screenshot this, you can do whatever you want, zoom in, freeze the video, uh, and I'll have this for download later. But generally, the scores kind of uh, go along what you would expect. So the lower price bikes, you know, you tend to get less performance out of them. So they get a lower score. It doesn't mean they're not a good bike. It just means, <clears throat> relatively speaking, their performance is not as good. And as you go up in price, typically, you get higher performance motorcycles. There may be trade-offs with maintenance, with reliability, with ownership, for sure. But I can just tell you the performance. It's up to you what you want to do in terms of you know, what brand you want or what maintenance you can accept or how much money you have. It's not for me to decide what you can afford. I'm just telling you the performance. Uh, so anyway, that's how these scores are. So like in the midweight, in the midweight category, the highest scores that I have uh, are the Tiger 900, so which makes sense because they're the most expensive. Uh, the Ducati Desert X is right up there. Uh, the 890 Adventure R is up there really high. Uh, we've got also really high is the, uh, let's see, the Touareg 660 gets, gets a pretty high rating. It's one of my one of my favorite bikes for sure. V-Storm 800. So we'll compare all these bikes, the, the main competitors here in a second. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get too much further into that, but it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Now, let's talk about comparisons, and I'm gonna put this here up on the screen, try to put it somewhere to the side here, I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the Transalp, 750 versus the V-Storm 800 DE versus the Touareg 660 from Aprilia and Yamaha's Tenere 700. I really feel that these are the four main middleweight off-road capable adventure motorcycles that everybody's looking at right now and talking about. We're not really going to talk about the KLR 650 because that's almost its own thing. We're not going to talk about the next step up, which is like a KTM 890 or a Tiger 900 or a Desert X, because the price point gets way, way higher, almost double what these are. So let's look at this like ten to twelve thousand dollar range. All right. So the Transalp wins on price. It is the best value. Well, it's the best price. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best value, but it's the best price here between all these bikes. For eight hundred bucks more, you can get a Tenere seven hundred. Uh, for another like $1,600, you go up to the V-Storm 800 DE, and these are 2024 prices, by the way, I updated them. The Touareg is uh, $12,299. All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, power, so the Transalp has 83 horsepower in the US, 90 horsepower in other countries. V-Storm 800 is, matches that 83. The Touareg is 80 horsepower, and the Tenere is down there with 72 horsepower. Uh, the weight, the, the Transalp, Touareg, and Tenere all weigh uh, relatively the same, right about 450, 455 pounds, around 204 to 206 kilos. For some reason, the V-Storm 800 is just a porker. It's uh, 507 pounds or 230 kilos, and I don't know why. I don't know where that weight's coming from. It doesn't feel that much heavier than these bikes, but it is uh, on paper anyway. Uh, the seat height, so the Tenere is definitely not good if you're short. It's an inch taller or about you know, 25 millimeters uh, taller than all the other bikes here. Uh, so that's something to consider depending on your height. Uh, fuel range, so I calculated fuel range based on 50, assuming 50 miles a gallon or 4.6 liters per 100 kilometer, uh, just multiplied that by the size of their tank. So, uh, you know, the best fuel range is definitely the V-Strom because it's got that 20 liter tank. Uh, you know, the Transalp does okay. The Touareg does a little bit better. The Tenere has the worst fuel range of the bunch because it has the smallest tank. Now, do all the bikes get exactly 50 miles a gallon? Nah, not exactly, but they're all kind of around that 50 mile a gallon mark if they're ridden in the same fashion. At least that's what I've found in my, in my testing. 
Uh, suspension travel. So the Touareg definitely wipes the floor here uh, with these others. The Touareg has a genuine long travel suspension and it is phenomenal. Uh, you know, 240 millimeter suspension on the Touareg. Uh, the other bikes have, uh, so, you know, the, the Honda's 200 millimeter suspension, the V-Strom strikes a nice balance in the middle at 220, and the Tenere 700 is a 200 millimeter travel bike. Suspension adjustability, they're all adjustable except the Transup. The Transup just gives you preload adjustability. We've talked about the air filter thing, but uh, so uh, all the bikes have easy air, uh, air box access except the Transup. The Transup, you have to rip apart the dash and the fuel tank and get all that off. The other bikes, the Touareg has a little cover up uh, behind the handlebars. The Tenere and the V-Strom have it under the seat. So, you know, the, the Transup definitely loses here by, by a pretty big margin. Uh, service intervals, the, the Tenere 700 has an amazingly long service interval and that's a really big factor for people who ride a lot. The other bikes are shorter. Uh, cruise control and tubeless wheels, the only bike that gives you that here is going to be the Touareg, although we did add that to the Transalp. Hopefully you watched that episode, I think the last episode. You can do that aftermarket, but it doesn't come from the factory. Electronics, uh, they all have ABS and traction control. No, I'm sorry. Uh, all of them have ABS and traction control except the Tenere 700 that only has ABS. And then for scoring, so for off-road score, uh, I gotta adjust my uh, sheet here a little bit. So for off-road score out of 10, I give the Transalp a five out of 10. It's limited a bit by the suspension travel, the ground clearance, and the suspension performance. The V-Storm 800, I'm gonna give a six. Uh, the Touareg, I'm gonna give a nine. It's phenomenal off-road, phenomenal. Uh, the Tenere 700 is somewhere between like the V-Storm and the, and the Touareg, so I'm gonna give it a seven. On-road score, uh, the Transalp, the V-Strom, and the Touareg are all, I'm going to give them all sevens for on-road performance, and the Tenere 700 gets a six. Definitely a one little step down from, from its competition. Uh, comfort score, the Transalp and the V-Strom, I'm giving eights out of ten. They are both equally comfortable and very, very comfortable. The Touareg is just a tiny bit less in terms of the seating comfort and the wind protection. also has a little more engine heat, and the Tenere is one uh, mark below that uh, again. So the least comfortable bike here, another way to put this is the least comfortable bike here is the Tenere for sure, and I will stand by that to my grave. It's definitely the least comfortable in stock form compared to these other ones, uh, it's all, but it's also very good off-road, and there's a lot of other factors that you have to consider. The fun score, I give them all sevens, uh, except the Touareg is a little is one notch higher in the terms of the fun score. Uh, it sounds amazing, it's really quick, it's punchy, it just has more character, I just have more fun riding it. Uh, and I think most people who've tested all these would agree. So I'm gonna give that an eight. So the total score, how this ranks out is that the Tenere 700 gets 26 out of 40, the Transup gets 27 out of 40, the V-Strom gets 28 out of 40, and the Touareg gets 31 out of 40. Now remember, these are performance uh, scores. These are not considering the, the maintenance, the reliability, the, the cost, all those things. You have to make those decisions on your own and I've given you that information. Um, so yes, I do think, like in other words, I think the V-Strom is just a tiny bit better bike overall than the Transalp. Uh, if you're just asking me what is the best middleweight adventure bike to buy, it's the Aprilia. By far, period, end of story, like no questions. And the Touareg is the bike that I would buy among all these, hands down, hands down, every single day. It just blows these other bikes away. Again, not talking about maintenance, not talking about potential reliability, not talking about cost, not talking about dealer network, just how the bikes perform. Uh, and I do think the Tenere 700 is showing its age a little bit, but it still scores right up there uh, with, with, with these other bikes. It's just one tiny, tiny bit less in terms of the overall performance. That's about the best I can do in terms of a comparison. I, I hope this is useful and I hope it's not getting people upset with these scores or whatever. <laughs> I'm just doing my best and I have ridden all these bikes extensively. Uh, I've actually owned all these bikes except the V-Strom. Anyway, I hope this was useful. If you have disagreement, if you have questions, if you have uh, clarification, put that down below and I'll try to get back to you. A lot of people ask me which motorcycle in this segment around this price range would I buy? And I, I think I just kind of answered this, but it's the Aprilia. Um, the Aprilia is just on another level. I feel, like the, I feel like Aprilia designed the Touareg from scratch, from the ground up to be the best 50-50 middleweight adventure bike that it could be. And from 50-50, I mean like, if, if there's a bike to ride half the time on the road and half the time off the road, I feel like the Touareg is the best I've ever tested for a bike like that. 
And I think what you get for the price point, the, the, the engaging, powerful motor, the phenomenal chassis, it's agile, it's stable at the same time. The suspension is phenomenal, uh, probably the best in the whole segment, uh, I would say. Uh, yeah, it might be the best in the entire segment, even compared to those more expensive bikes uh, in the midweight segment. Um, there's just, there, there's really nothing bad to say about the Aprilia, except, well, there's some engine heat and you know the dealer network kind of sucks but really that is a phenomenal bike and i've spent so much time with all these bikes i think it's you know i'm i'm within my rights to say that is it the bike you should buy not necessarily no you have to consider all these factors you know uh, for yourself uh, because a lot of people are going to value reliability and dealer network and things like that and comfort or whatever beyond some of those other performance factors because how many people really ride their bike to the limit unless you're a professional rider or a racer we're not and i'm not in that group either you know we're just normal people we're just doing our best we're not able to push things to the absolute limit so you may not need all that performance but the aprilia is the bike i would buy now if we took that out of the equation what if i had to choose between a transalp a tenere and a v-storm 800 i would buy the v-storm 800 so between the Japanese adventure bikes, middleweight adventure bikes, right? You, you've got the, the V-Strom 800DE, at least if you want a 21 inch front wheel, right? You've got the Tenere and you've got now the Transalp. I'd buy the V-Strom. I think the V-Strom is actually the best overall package. The suspension is far superior to the Honda. I can get to the air filter under the seat. The electronics are better, the TFT is better. Um, I just think it's, it's just a slightly more competent bike overall than the Transalp is. It's also a little bit more expensive. It is heavier. Uh, but it didn't feel that much heavier when I tested it, you know, for the for the month that I had it. So I don't know. Between those three, I'm just giving you my honest advice. Yeah, I'd get the V-Strom. Although the Transalp is still a phenomenal motorcycle, and it is less money, and it is a Honda. So those things count for something. All right. Well, I think it is time. <laughs> I'm getting a little emotional. Uh, this has been quite the series with the Transalp, the most involved I've ever done. Um, it's been a real privilege to do this. I've enjoyed it. I, I love this bike. I love working with all of you as my audience, all the partners in this build. It's been fantastic. And it's uh, been a real, real pleasure. So the Transalp is gonna find a new home. Uh, actually, here's a secret. It already has. It's just the way I film these videos, things, the timing is weird. So it actually already has gone to a happy new owner and I hope he's enjoying the heck out of it. Uh, so thank you all who expressed interest in buying it, but it sold very, very, very quickly. And I am on to already testing new bikes as I film this uh, video here in the studio right now. So anyway, I'm a little bit emotional to see this end. Uh, if there are questions you have about the Transalp, uh, put them below. I will specifically read the comments on this video and answer your questions since we didn't do a dedicated Q&A video. I'll just do that below in the comments. Thank you all for participating in this series. I hope it was useful. If you like this independent motorcycle testing, motorcycle journalism that I do here, uh, consider supporting the channel and there are ways to do that in the description and the pinned comment below. Other than that, ride safe and I will see you out there. never had the slightest mechanical issue or concern or or anything it's been it's run like a swiss watch mechanically speaking